Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, you are now tuned in to the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful state of Honolulu, Hawaii, where we're coming from live from the state of Denver, Colorado, via the beautiful state of Honolulu, Hawaii. First of all, I want to say um, welcome to 2020. This is the first show here on Think Tech Hawaii, and we got a very interesting episode today. As we know, we're walking into 2020. This is our first episode. But last year, 2019, for our investors around the globe into the U.S. stock market, seen a very, very great year with the S&P 500 turning about 20 to 20, 28 to 29 uh, percent. We had a very great year for investors that was bullish. Right? If you was bearish, not so much. But throughout that whole year, we had a very great year. But the question remained, right? We had an episode that we shot last year. And we had James Fortlin on from Wall Street, Uncle James, as I like to call him, and he predicted the 2019 bull market. In 20 of last year, everybody was saying the market was going to go down. Everybody was saying that we we're going into a recession. Watch out for the recession. I know so many of my friends and family that pulled out their money. They said, hey, you know, I know the market's about to collapse, but the market did great. And James was very bullish on the, bearish on the market. And I wonder why was he so bearish? So we had him on the last episode. And this is what he said. As you can see, he was saying things as far as the January barometer, the ninth year, all these ways that he was so built up into the bear market. So I had to bring him back to ask him why was he so confident in the bear in the bull in the bull bull market? Why was he so confident in the bull market in 2019 when everybody else around the globe was so bearish? And most importantly, what does he think of 2020? So without further ado, let me bring on Uncle James all the way from the beautiful state of New Jersey up there by Wall Street. James, we're glad to have you on. How you doing up there? How are you? Happy New Year to everybody. Oh yeah, Happy New Year. Now, as you was hearing me say, and last, last time you was on, you were saying some great things about you believed into the 2019 uh, bull market. The first question is, why did you believe in the bull, and why were you so confident? Oh well, it was uh, first of all the the corporate tax cut uh, that was instituted by the Trump administration uh, was going basically it put us more in an even foot with the rest of the world, and I think a lot of people overlook the impact of that. Uh, and oh, basically, for the last oh I don't know 10, 15 years, the U.S. has had the highest tax uh, corporate tax rate. Uh, which drove a lot of business out of the country. Uh, in some cases, it was cheaper for, say, Ford Motor Company to build cars in Mexico and sell them back in the United States, and they pay a lot less taxes by doing that. Uh, and that's really no way to run a country. Uh, but Trump was key to that, and they lowered the corporate tax rate. And I just, to me, it looked like it was going to be a nonstop earning machine. That was That's the first thing. The, the second thing is a little more... Uh, there's actually three parts. The the second thing was also there was a big push to sort of deregulate uh, and maybe uh, hollow out what a lot of people call the administrative state in Washington, where uh, there's just a lot of people in Washington trying to centrally manage everyone's businesses and life. And the less of that you have historically, the better the economy gets. So the bigger Washington is, the worse the economy gets, the smaller Washington's impact, the better the economy gets. It's just, it's like in an inverse relationship. Um, and then the third thing was the, the, was the, was the tariff business, um, the free trade agreement or the trade agreement with Mexico and Canada, I thought was really significant. Uh, and the, uh, the old NAFTA needed to be reworked. And then a lot of the rest of the year, I've been harping on, you know, where everybody else has been saying recession, 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 or impeachment, 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 or Russia, Russia, Russia. I've been saying China, China, China. And so the, the, the second half of the year, I think you got a lot of steam because of a push to negotiate with China. And as you see the last couple of days, I mean, what was the market up today? 267 points or something like that on the Dow. Um, you know, you have the first step in a road uh, to making a, a long-term, fairer and equitable trade deal with China. So I just think that's enormous for the U.S., for U.S. companies and for the U.S. economy. So those are kind okay. of the three things. Yeah. So 
you post on the tariffs, right? We're going to get into the trade war later. And now so I want you to kind of reiterate. You spoke about the January January barometer. You said that every right. year that ends with a nine, uh, every year that ends with a nine, except for three years, which I think it was 1929, 1969, something like right. that. So you would right, say right. every year. Um, it's not very superstitious when you said it, that every year that ends with a nine is usually an up year, right? And you right. use the January barometer, and you said the third year of every presidency is usually right. a bull market. And you said right. uh, every year, the pre, um, pre-election pre year, 2019 was a pre-election yeah. year, and it was Donald Trump's third election year. You said you used a lot of historical data to calculate yes. Yes. this bull market that was yeah. about to happen. And I want to tell people about the market settlement. Everybody, the reason why we did that episode, because everybody was like recession, recession, people was pulling their money out, people was running from it. But you brought in these very superstitious numbers of every third year is it this. Was, it's long-term long data. Hmm. Long-term it, data. Long so now, data, yeah. now that you did that, we did that in 2019. <laughs> What is right. your market predictions for 2020 and why? Oh boy. Well, first of all, 2020, we got uh, we got kind of a the January barometer. There's even a there's even a shorter version of the first, I think it's the first five days of trading. And if the market ends up in the first five days of trading, it means the whole rest of the year it's gonna be up. And we were up the first five days of trading. So that's a big positive. Um I would say that the way this is what I look at more than anything. This is see last year there was a lot of historic data because there was so much noise. Um, really, what I would call anti-Trump sentiment in the media, even in the financial press, and uh, from a lot of different areas. Um, and this year, I think we go into 2020 with a little different view. It's very hard for a lot of people, or for most of us, to learn anything from a year where things go well. So it's hard to learn when the market's up and you make money. But the one thing I think a lot of people learned last year the hard way was you're never going to get rich by bashing the president. It's just not going to happen. And as long as they keep bashing the president, the market's going to go up. It's just, it's this huge, we used to call it the wall of worry. It's, I mean, today I'm looking, we hit a record and almost every major financial website, all they were talking about is when the next recession is coming. And I'm like, you just signed a huge trade deal with you, with China. What, that's not even, it makes a headline. You got it. And we finally signed the Mexico, Canadian, Canadian the new, I, I forget what the acronym is for the new NAFTA. It took me like 20 years to get that one right. Um, so we finally signed that also. And that doesn't make any headlines, but we're talking about, you know, when the next recession is coming. And I'm like, come on, people like it's it's we're only January 15th already here. Let's like let's give it a little rest here. Um, I just think that if people learned a hard lesson. Like I always tell people, you invest money in the stock market to make money. If you are if you want to save the world, plant a tree. Or write a book and teach kids how to, how to invest money like you're doing. But in the stock market, we're here to make money. That's what we're here to do. And people who g get involved in investing for other reasons than to make money are already, you know, making a mess out of things. And... I'm not saying you got to love the president. You know what? I didn't. I wasn't a fan of Barack Obama. I wasn't a fan of his policies. But he was the president. We had to deal with. Him. So you had a particular investing strategy to take advantage of many of the, the policies that he was pushing forward. Now we have a new president, and you have to have a different set of investment policies to capture what's being pushed forward with this president. And this president is a much more volatile president. Uh, he's so it's going to create a lot more volatility and turmoil in the markets. But last year it proved, you know, nonstop that all that volatility was all buying opportunities, no matter when it was and no matter how, you know. And on top of that, like we also saw that how and, and we just saw it again with this Iran thing the last couple of days where how bad all this computerized trading is. I mean, the other night, you know, you had the president take out a major terrorist, probably the number one terrorist in the entire world, 
contrary to what the media is reporting. Um, you had a lot of people in Iran very happy about that, including anybody who has any sense in most of the rest of the world. Um, and then Iran retaliated with this sort of phony baloney missile barrage where they shot a bunch of missiles out into the middle of the Iraqi desert, which really didn't do much of anything. And any amount of just knowledge on the subject, you would have known right away that this was this was kind of a safe face response. They really weren't looking to have the U.S. get provoked. And Trump didn't take the bait. Now, of course, while that was going on, they shot down an airplane that they claim was not on purpose, but I have a tendency to think otherwise. And uh, they, you know, it, 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 the media was going crazy about how we're going to have World War III. And I'm like, we've been in a, a Cold War with Iran since 1979 was since uh, the, uh, the, the big hostage crisis, what it was called. And we've had, they've been fighting with us nonstop since. This is nothing out of the ordinary at all. And the only difference thing is we actually fought back for a change, which is kind of nice. Um, and, I, and I just think that showed the computerized trading sold off the market really quickly, which was a great way to take advantage. And if you were a buyer... <laughs> By the next day, you realize World War Two just World War Three just wasn't happening. And uh, as as we put, you know, they do on Facebook, we put we're marked safe from World War Three on our Facebook pages because it just wasn't. You know, I knew right away that it was ridiculous. But people were like, they were like, this is the end. There's going to be a draft. They're going to round everybody up and send them off. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It was it was really silly, actually. It was. It was borderline silly and you're you're you know you you're a military guy i mean if we were going to have a draft the congress would have to authorize it it's not like the mm -hmm. the military is just going to start calling up people because they have your phone number and they're going to say hey james i know you're a little old but we want to work we're, we're sending you off to iraq and i'm like i'm like if unless you're sending me to the iranian army it's not going to help you too much because i'm kind of old and we're <laughs> out of shape but uh, you know <laughs> i i'd be i'd be more help I, for you, if I played on the other team, you know, and like that would be, that's how bad I am. Right. So it like, you know, it's stuff like that. So I just think we learned a lot of lessons that we, a lot of people I think learned for the first time, or at least they should have, that you can't look your, your political preferences or your likes and dislikes have nothing to do with investing. And I, I think I'm going to, and I'm going to, and I'm going to like, you know, last year I pulled out a bunch of old numbers because we were just barraged by, you know, this is the end of the world and Trump is like going to destroy the universe and it's going to be a trade war and a, and a shooting war and a, this war and a, that war and we're going to get taken over by Mexico and we're going to, and now we have, and global warming is going to destroy us all and by the, you know, meanwhile, I mean, look at all, look at the global warming scare. Speaking of our former president, he retires from office and buys a beautiful mansion on the beach in Martha's Vineyard. So I guess if there really is a global warming Dang. thing and seas are rising, he he would know more than anybody. Yes. Now this is the thing, like you just made some good points about the 2019 market, how you predicted it, and all the noise that's in the marketplace, yes. right? With all the things going on and the behavior, how it brought buying opportunities in 2019. Now, before yes. we go any further, uh, we got to jump into a quick break, right? But we come okay. out of this commercial break, we're going to go in and we're going to talk about, you know, how would you position yourself to take advantage of a bull market in 2019 or how would you hedge yourself? So we're going to take a quick break right now and we'll be right back. Hey, aloha everyone and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo.
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of Truth of All Ages, we're coming back now from our break. And before our break, we was talking about in 2019, how did James Fortland predict the bear, uh, the bull, why do I keep saying bear? Why did he predict the bull market of 2019 and what is he thinking of 2020? Now, he spoke about some of the crucial facts that we talked about with the, about the January barometer, the first five days of the market. And he also spoke about how the tears and the trades, uh, how the tear, um, the tariffs and the deal with China and Mexico kind of opened up the market and brought very great buying opportunities to the bull investors. Now, the first question as we come back into that, I'm going to ask James, right? We just sound of the quote unquote phase one of the trade deal with China. And I kind of look at it and I always said that Trump will win the trade war. My question is to you, James, is Trump winning, is President Trump winning the trade war? Oh, massively. Uh, I, if you talk to, I used to do a lot of business with Chinese companies uh, back in the old days, and they are they were basically crying. I mean, they all hate Trump because he is sticking it to them really hard, and they're much more. They're very dependent on exports at this point in the game, and they're uh, they have a lot more to lose out of this than than we have, and uh, Trump played them hard and i think a lot of it was stretched out just because they believed a lot of stuff they saw in the media like a lot of other people and they were foolish to believe that they should have picked up trump's book called the art of the deal and he spells out exactly how you do all this stuff um in that book and i'm and again i'm not saying the guy i'm saying if you're even if you're not going to like him at least know something about him and uh, he spelled out a lot of his negotiating tactics, which are, were very clear. He employed many of them. In fact, the Chinese even tried to employ some right back to him. So maybe they did read the art of the deal. There was a couple of times where they try to pull out of the agreement and do a bunch of other stuff. So I think it's going to only get better for actually. And in the end, at the end of the day, it's going to be better for both countries. It's going to be it's a win win. I hate to use that word because it gets so overused. But if, if we if if the U.S. comes out of this as a win, China is going to come out of this as a winner as well. It's going to be better for everybody. Okay. Now, and I agree. I always told people, I looked at uh, America is the customer and China was like the business owner, you know, because America, we, we're in a trade deficit where we buy everything for, for the most part and China in a position where they make everything. So my ideology was that if a business owner and a customer got into it, who would you think win? The customer is always right, right? Because we're the ones that are buying everything. If we don't spend our dollars or take our dollars somewhere else, you know, who's going to come up on the short end? Now, my thing to you is now that we know that uh, Trump has done a favorable deal for America with, um, I saw that um, to close the trade deficit that China has spent like $200 billion. Um, they're going to lift some of the tariffs, things like that or whatnot. My question to you, if going into 2020, how would you position your portfolio or how would you what stocks would you buy going into 2020 to take advantage of the possible bull market that you're predicting here in 2020? Ooh, well, first of well, all, I, I think I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. This is an election right. year. Right. So it is an election year. So usually historically, the market's a little odder in election years, although it still has a bias to the upside. But I think we're also in a, even a bigger cycle is starting to take over right now. And I think we're in one of those sort of um, huge historical pivot points. I would call it a technological pivot point. You could probably say 1982 was sort of a point like this uh, where the Super Bowl took off. And maybe 1994 was another one of those huge pivot points uh, where they rolled out all this, you know, cell phones and PCs and the Internet and everything kind of Netscape, Netscape, Netscape. And we had the dot com things start and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think we're in another, another one of those major pivot points. But this time we're going to have some uh some of the same things from bolts from 92 or 94 as well as 82. in 82 we had a lot of consolidation um i think there's some older industries like cable tv and uh maybe some of the phone companies 
um, and as well as some sort of newer industries that you're going to be surprised that technology is making them either obsolete and forcing consolidation um, or just the customer itself, like you were talking about, has changed their taste. So there's a, sort of a taste for different things. Um, the second thing I think, again, is I'm going to urge people do not fight the tape, as we say. The market is going to, it looks to me like it's going to probably tack on another 25% this year. So I'm looking for somewhere like 3750 or something like that, like somewhere up in that range. Um, so what I'm looking at, what I'm thinking is we're going to see is more mergers. We're probably going to start to see more IPOs. We're going to see maybe an internet reboot or the start of it where we go to a sort of a blockchain based internet. I know I was early on, I was negative on Bitcoin or I called it Bitcoin, but I still think the underlying technology is pretty cool. Um, I think you're going to, you might even see some change in the way the dollar, you might see a renewed pegging the dollar to some kind of solid uh, source of value like gold or perhaps some kind of cryptocurrency that acts like gold. Uh, Bitcoin is a little too small in the liquidity size. It's just not big enough um, to do it, but it works like it's engineered. The program works like gold works. Um, I also think that you're probably going to see uh, some newer, a new technology, some new technologies like AI. But I think it's I'm not a believer that AI is going to take over our lives and we're all going to be obsolete and robots are going to do everything for us. I think AI might knock out companies like, for example, Uber may have trouble competing because suddenly you're going to get a little AI system in your cell phone that allows customers to call you directly and you create your own Uber. You don't need the big company. You don't need a centralized. And I, I think there's a lot of that. And I think a lot of people are very much overlooking that. And so I just think, and also when you have states like California that are basically trying to stop uh, sort of freelance workers or put an end to it, which is, I think, catastrophic and totally crazy. Um, and New Jersey's even trying to do the same thing to some degree. Um, I think that with AI is so advanced, it would make all those Uber drivers, instead of being an Uber driver, they'd be an independent uh, they'd be now Uber entrepreneurs and they'd all be their own, it would be their own little business. So they wouldn't work for Uber anymore. They'd, they'd be like their own Uber. And I think there's a lot of, uh, technology now, uh, that we're going to see fruition of. We're also going to see big changes in some of the privacy issues that are available, that are on the internet, a la the reboot of the internet. But I think that just the willy nilly selling of people's data and collecting data, uh, I think there's, it's going to be limited, uh, and I think you're going to get, you you may get control back of your own data, which, which to me is really significant. In other words, we're going to have more privacy again, which is the big problem because that's why people like me, I love Alexa, but I would never use it because I don't trust it. And even <laughs> I noticed on Apple, on the on all the Apple Voice activated stuff, when I when I when I updated the thing, it said, "Oh, if you want to use the Voice Act, when is it okay to use it? When when you address the, you know, the app, or like, and we like it basically says that they're not going to share you, that they're not going to be listening to you right now. Although it just came on when we started the the call here on my <laughs> iPad, started talking to me, so maybe it is listening. I don't know. Like, so these things are, uh, you know, sometimes okay. I think I'm hallucinating." Go ahead. Now, the biggest critic you're going to have, 2019, right. we're going to 2020. We've had 10 years of a bull market. I mean, the market has gone up since 2019 for an entire decade. This is the longest running bull we've ever seen. And every day we wake up, there's another 100 points. There's another 200 points. So when people see that, everybody always thinking expansion. Maybe we're at the peak. So that's the first thing, you know, after the peak, we're going to have a recession. So what do you have to say to the people that are going to say, well, we've been in a bull market for 10 years. It's just been going up, up, up and up. It would sort of be crazy to not think or to look for a downside. Well, first of all, I don't think we were in a bull market. 
I think the market went up only really because the Federal Reserve flooded since 2008. The Federal Reserve just flooded basically what, what they were calling helicopter finance. They were flying around with helicopters and throwing money out the window and hoping guys like you and me would pick it up and spend it somewhere. And uh, but what we were doing is we were buying stocks with that money. It was it's like uh, the 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 rally probably prior to 2016. Um, a good portion of that was just an inflationary adjustment from the basically the collapse. The, it, it was all that QE, like that quantitative easing stuff uh, from the disaster, the 2008 financial crisis. And I don't really think the market was up that much. I mean, the economy didn't grow that much. It was, uh, it was kind of, we were sort of stagnant for 10 years. And, and again, I'm not, don't, think I'm trying to blame anybody or anything. I'm just saying it, it is what it is. And I think when you suddenly you got a new administration in uh, that was clearly an outsider and a business owner, a large business owner, particularly involved in the real estate business, you got somebody who know, who's very interested in what goes on in banking and real and interest rates and things like that. Um, and so you have a lot of push, um, I think, on uh, t like like there's just been a lot of things done, whether it's getting rid of Dodd-Frank, whether it's, um, you know, yelling at the Federal Reserve, whether it's deregulating, whether it's cutting tax. I mean, Larry Kudlow was all over TV yesterday bragging about how tax cut 2.0 is in the works. And so you get a you get a, a Trump reelection. You're going to have a storm. I I don't think this is going to be the typical second term for a president. I think you're going to have a a storm of activity from the White House and from Congress doing a whole bunch of things that they probably should have been doing the last two or three years, but they've been busy fighting with the president instead, or trying to, or some people would say undermining the president. Um, and, and, you know, if you have different ideas, that's fine on an, on an idea ground. But I just think this is all, uh, this is very much, uh, you know, if Trump came out tomorrow and said, my administration has cured cancer, I guarantee CNN and some of these other stations would, would say that Trump is terrible because he's going to unemploy all these people that work in hospitals. And this is a terrible thing to happen. You know, I mean, I mean, they were cheering for, they were, they were crying over a, a, a murdering terrorist. The guy's killed at least 600 people documented. Uh, he's like a mastermind terrorist. And they're, they're on TV, like crying about how he was assassinated. And then they rag about the last time the United States did this was with uh, Admiral Yokohama or whatever it is in Japan. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that kind of. That worked out pretty well for the U.S. in those days. So maybe this is not a bad thing after all this might, you know, I mean, I just, like, it, it, this, is, this is what you were just flooded with this, this noise, as you called it. And, and, it, and it, it's, it's just, you, you, as an investor, you really have to buffer this and filter it out of your head because it's, and, it, and it's hard because it comes from everywhere, including most of the financial press, which is just, it's horrible. It used to be very good, and now it's like a lot of the stuff they publish is just garbage. All right. Well, James, we got to get ready. We got to get out of here. As, all, as always, we always have fun. But we got to bring the show to an end. I want to say, tell people, how can they find you? How can they follow you? All right. Well, I do have a Facebook page called Unofficial Wall Street. And if you're fortunate enough to be in New York City, I do do financial tours on Wall Street, which are kind of a lot of fun, especially if you want to learn the history and some of the crazy stuff that gone, uh, has gone on. Um, and usually I can be reached at the page on Facebook is called unofficial wall street, as I said, and that's usually the best way to get in touch with me through that page. And I'm more than willing to talk to anybody. I don't give financial advice anymore. I am out of that business. Um, but I will tell you which way I might think the market's going or stuff that I think is really important or stuff I think is not important. Like, okay. all right, well, that's James Portland. My name is Prince Dax. As always, until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see us do around the globe, peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you.